One thing that has always caught the attention of people who are unfamiliar with the Church of Our Lord, when they attend the worship assemblies on the first of the week, they notice that we observe the Lord's Supper as an avenue of worship. And we do it every first day of the week in the Assembly of the Saints. That's one of the things that they will notice. And we recognize from the teaching of the New Testament that the Lord's Supper is to be observed each first day of the week. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. The people there were doing what an inspired apostle had taught them to do in worship. And they did it under his apostolic approval in his presence. <coughs> Thus, as you consider the worship of the Lord's church on the first day of the week, then, of course, there is to have that singular worship, the Lord's Supper, along with four other avenues of worship. Today, I would like for us to examine some abuses of the Lord's Supper. And I'd like for us to do that by noticing what the New Testament has to say about the Corinthian church and the abuses that it made in the words from the Apostle Paul to help us see Corinth's condition as regards to worship. First of all, he says that they have come together for the worse. Verse 17. Then he says, they had come together in a divided state. Verse 18. Then they had come together with an allegiance to men. Verse 19. Following our next point is they had come together with no thought as to the real significance of the supper. Verse 20. And they had come together in mixing their common meal items in with the worship itself. Verses 21 and 22. And then our sixth point, they had come together with no discernment of the Lord's body. And thus, we see that their participation was in an unworthy manner. Verses 27 through 39. I suggest to you pausing here that if they could do this, having been so recently taught by an apostle of Christ, what about us 2,000 years later with the general attitude that prevails concerning the authority of the New Testament? There is little concern today for the New Testament as a divine pattern. In fact, it's even being spoken against and challenged even in the church. But because of what happened here, we see that the apostle indicates that there was a great spiritual sickness in the middle of the church among these brethren. He says, with some of them actually in death, verse 30. I say spiritual weakness. May I comment along this line too? When you corrupt or pervert any act of worship, it's to no good end. It cannot help you. It can only hurt you. The wonderful privilege of worship was being abused. It was perverted and mishandled. We must continually, therefore, examine ourselves. That, of course, should be done objectively and in all honesty about everything we think, say, and do. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We must consider all the acts of worship. We must consider the why of our assembling together in this assembly. What's on our mind in every act. There needs to be discipline and training in the mind to focus on the actual act and what it means. So we must ensure that our worship is in spirit and in truth. 
John 4 and verse 24. Jesus said there, God seeketh such to worship Him. So we should be, quote, of the such that He seeks. But now that was in the church at Corinth. And we can learn much about the Lord's Supper by the Lord correcting the church at Corinth's abuse of the Supper. But I want us to speak of the abuse of the Lord's Supper in our time, and I certainly won't pretend in this sermon to cover all possible abuses. But I think mainly of the Lord's Church itself, and each one of us when we're engaged in the Lord's Supper is one of the avenues of worship on the first day of the week. We make mention of these points regarding, first of all, we abuse the Lord's Supper when there's no anticipation of worship. We are worshipers, being Christians, when we come together. We're here because we want to please the Lord. We're authorized to be here by His Word. So we worship. We continue to do that which the Lord has commanded whenever He wants us to do it. And daily we're His servants, our bodies as living sacrifices. So the Christian is a worshiper, and worship is to be a great and continual part of our Christian living. Yes, we are to exhort one another in this worship as we each one engage in the acts of worship. Hebrews 10, 25, 24 and 25. The supper is mentioned as a rallying cause of the saints on the first day of the week, as I've mentioned in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Now, if the supper is meaningless to us, as we think of it, and as we approach the observance of it, it's going to be meaningless as we partake of it as well. We abuse the Lord's Supper if we have the view that this is all that matters. All my life, before I became preaching, which has been virtually all my life, I've seen people have the idea that, well, the Lord's Supper, if we partake of it, we've done whatever's necessary. Well, you know, if that really was the case, then all we would do would come and assemble, take the Lord's Supper, and go home. It simply says that other acts of worship just really aren't worth much. There are five avenues of worship. To have the one singular worship God demands of the church in the assembly of the saints on the first day of the week. Five, in other words, component parts of the singular worship of the church on the first day of the week. These are necessary. So all five are important. There's been too much of an attitude that says, just so I get the Lord's Supper. I suggest anybody that's thinking that way over any period of time just simply doesn't study the Bible. They have an idea that is their own standard and they don't seek to know all the Bible teaches on correct worship. It is important. No one would deny that it's important. We all need to be thinking about every act as important for they're all the way we worship God in this assembly. But for all of its importance, it is not all important. It's fruitless to be half-hearted in all of the worship and then try to be of a spiritual mind when it's time to observe the supper. It reminds me some of people who many years ago, or your book was written, are you going to church and enjoying it less? And the idea was that there's got to be some sort of dog and pony show always changing to grasp the entertainment or to entertain the attention and hold it of the people. Do you know what that says? During the week, they're not doing what Christians do every day. And they're seeking for some sort of spiritual high in the worship to make them feel like they're something that they're really not. Because the next day, they're going to go back to living like the world. When a person lives righteous from day to day, 
then they're getting ready to assemble with the other saints doing the same thing to worship God except to be on the first day of the week. It also shows that they attribute worship to some sort of just an emotional thing. Well, no one rules the emotions out. That's not the point. The point is, is that you're to live faithful to God every day and not try to have something that says, well, this will make me feel better if I just do this part. But moving on, we abuse the supper if we think that observance somehow makes up for the time misspent in sin, indifference, and carelessness. Not one word is said in the New Testament about the Lord's Supper affecting cleansing for the disobedient child of God. It is amazing when you begin to talk with some members of the church who have been members for years as to what they think happens when they observe the Lord's Supper. If a Christian is faithful to God, he's in no better position to take the Lord's Supper than he is to sing or to pray. If he's unfaithful, Without making proper correction in life, he only adds sin to sin and going through the motions of the Lord's Supper's observance. Look at the items in the worship, the avenues of worship, where we show our homage and devotion to God according to God's direction. They all indicate a person is living godly every day of the week. We abuse the supper if we spend the week or weekend in fun and games, perhaps on vacation, and just barely squeeze in time to make a service, arriving late, nearly to the point of exhaustion. And the way we describe later on is, yeah, we managed to get the supper. No, you didn't. You may think you did, but that wasn't what the Bible calls observing the Lord's Supper scripturally. Body and mind in such shape for worship is needed to worship in spirit. I don't think we understand that we ought to be preparing to have our minds to be able to think about the acts of worship and to be alert and to be involved in the worship. We are to worship with, in spirit and understanding, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. It's an abuse of all worship and not just the supper when I can barely find an hour to give to God. One of the flagrant abuses on the part of those who willfully absent themselves on Sunday mornings and then they'll rise to partake on Sunday evenings or afternoon as if some matter beyond their control blocked them that morning. All of us understand that sickness and emergencies arrive, so just remove that out of your thinking. Because I'm thinking of the willful absence. And then at a later worship assembly, partaking of the supper, it's as if God would subsidize, subsidize one's negligence. This is an abuse of the purpose and intent of the Lord's Supper, which is a memorial with significance for spiritual people. Another point that ought to be understood by Christians, and again based on Colossians 3.17, doing only what's authorized in the Scriptures, and that covers worship, of course, is that the Scriptures teach that number one, the Lord's Supper, is to be observed in the first day of the week worship assembly of a church of Christ and nowhere else. And number two, to partake of it anywhere else at any other time is not authorized by the New Testament. People think they can just assemble whenever they want to assemble. But the Lord established the largest and smallest organized entity of His one church 
in congregations, elders, deacons, members, teachers, preachers, when they're fully organized. And it's in the assembly of that congregation, wherever it may be geographically, that the worship of which we speak is carried out and carried out properly. If not, why couldn't any family here stay home and just worship as a family? Or we'll just worship this afternoon wherever we want to, in backyard, if you ever mind me that hot, whatever. These kinds of attitudes are not framed by the teaching of the totality of the Bible on the matter. We do not have such liberty. Such is not authorized, and thus it is sinful. God expects us to do the things He authorized in the assemblies, in the assemblies. If He wanted us to do them elsewhere, such as the Lord's Supper, and I'm speaking of the first day of the week assembly, then that would be another story indeed. But he didn't. These things I do not believe are difficult to grasp. Now you might not want to believe them. That's another story indeed. In fact, I think you'll find that with an honest heart, there's really little that you're going to have trouble with when it comes to what must I do to be saved and the answer God gives to that. And what must I do as a child of God to be faithful of the answers God gives to that. So we need to be mindful. We need to be examining ourselves in this avenue of worship and in all others that we will truly worship God in spirit and in truth, John 4, 24. And as Paul said to the Corinthians that our coming together, our assembling, will be for the better rather than for the worse. But now listen. If we're determined to violate the authority of the scriptures regarding each item of worship in the worship assembly, even the assembly itself, it will not be for the better. It will be for the worse and to our detriment. God accepts our service daily throughout the week because we abide by His will. And He accepts our worship on the same standard or by the same standard. It's not difficult. Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? We used to say that and still should to the denominations who say the Lord is my Savior, but then they go about doing as they please. But in this day and age, the first principles of the gospel and the fundamentals of the faith, which involves worship, seems to have to be gone back over with the church more than ever before. Because frankly, we get influenced by the affairs of this present world, especially the religious world. So let's be sure that we are truly people with a thus saith the Lord for all we believe and all we practice. And we do not take liberties where God does not grant those liberties. And they will act only upon those things authorized for us to do, whether it be in the worship, or whether it be in our daily activities. So how do you stand before God this morning? Let me ask you, have you worshipped Him in spirit and in truth? When we were singing, what were you thinking about? During this sermon, what have you been thinking about? During the prayers, were you praying? Contribution. If you just thought before the plate got to you that you'd yank out something and drop it in it, you didn't worship correctly. There's purposing and planning prior to the assembly to do what God requires in the assembly. So on with everything regarding the worship assembly of the church. These things are not in the Bible just to take up space. I don't know how many times I've said that. They're there to educate you and me. Because someday, brethren, please understand this. On the day of judgment, we will give an account on the basis of what we've been studying this morning. You must have Bible authority for what you believe and what you practice. Jesus says what He means and He means what He says in the Word of God. 
He's not going to change it just because I have a certain feeling or a certain whatever. That ought to be clear, especially to the Lord's church. Let's not be found tampering with God's way of doing things. We haven't studied about becoming a Christian this morning. Most everyone here that's old enough to be is a Christian. But you must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which belief is formed by the evidence contained in the written word, Romans 10, 17. Thus your confidence and trust in Him is based on a thus saith the Lord. You're commanded to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10. And that qualifies you to, to be baptized into Christ. If you don't have these other steps in the plan of salvation, there's no use being baptized. You can be baptized to please your wife, your children, your mother, daddy, or whatever other reason. But you must be baptized to obey the Lord. And for the reason he said you're to be baptized. It must come from the heart, Romans 6, 17, and 18. The whole heart must be involved. The will, the emotions, the conscience, the intellect. So obeying from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Thus we're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, and the Lord adds us to His church. And in that church, our worship and service is received of God. You know, there may be a lot of folks that do a whole lot of things that benefit a lot of people. I know there are, more than I'll ever be able to do. But God says that it's His church that He takes note of. There are going to be people at the judgment crying out all up one side, down the other, look what we did to help other folks. Yeah, but did you believe and obey the truth? And did you live faithful in the Lord's church? It'll be the church that Jesus delivers up to the Lord. He's the Savior of the body, the church. And you can do all sorts and sizes of things outside the church. It's not going to count for anything. Only those in the church reveal the fact. They trust in God based on His Word. And they love Him and prove it by their obedience to the truth. If you need to repent of sins, how humble are you to accept the truth regarding every aspect of your life and make the corrections necessary by repenting of those things and asking for forgiveness as you pray to your God and confess those sins. That's God's second law of pardon. I'm grateful for it. All of us as humans constantly are apt to make a mistake. Sometimes we'll do it and say, well, I shouldn't have done that. I'm grateful to be able to pray to God about that. I'm grateful for the ongoing, flowing, cleansing power of the blood of the Lamb that takes care of sins because of a disposition of heart that ever confesses sins and doesn't try to hide them. Doesn't try to say, well, I'm what I am because of everybody else. And usually we say that when I've done something bad, though. I, I'm bad because of everybody. I wouldn't have done this had it been for you, Jeff. And Jeff didn't know I was going to do that, but now you understand that. And that means, of course, when I say that, it was because you did something bad that made me bad. It's not my fault. Not my fault at all. It's your fault. That's how the devil works. So many times members of the church need to repent of those sins, but when they hear sermons like this, they, they just sit there and say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. And they'll say it right on into eternity. And right there before Christ, they'll be saying, but Lord. So I know the yeah, buts are going to be there on the, day of, on the day of judgment because Jesus said they would be. And it would avail them nothing. But depart from me into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. Nobody here honestly wants to hear that. So if you're not a Christian, please become one. Worship God acceptably. Serve Him faithfully. If you're a child of God and have wandered, admit it, confess it, repent of it, and be what God says by praying to Him for forgiveness. God wants to forgive us. He wants us in heaven with Him. So if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we urge you, we beg of you by the mercies of Christ to obey the truth as you need while we stand and sing.